Charlie to make the introductions of today's speaker. Right. Thank you very much, Louis. Um, so I would like to start by paying our respects to the Ngunnawal people um, on whose land many of us are sitting as we meet online today. Um, and I'd also like to extend um, that respect to the traditional owners of um, other lands where our participants may be joining from today. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Jason Sharples to speak at the RSCS seminars today. Uh, Jason is based at the School of Science at the UNSW um, Canberra campus, um, and he leads the UNSW Bushfire Research Group. Uh, he's worked in bushfires since 2006, um, studying bushfire dynamics, um, the interaction of bushfires with the atmosphere, um, and also um, the way that extreme bushfires develop. Uh, he's done that um, and is currently um, leading two ARC Discovery Indigenous projects, um, as well as a project with the Bushfires and Natural Hazards CRC. Um, as well as that, Jason um, has also been a volunteer firefighter uh, since 2003 um, and is now involved in the training of firefighters um, and fire behaviour analysts. Um, so I first met Jason um, virtually during the 2019-20 um, fire season. Um, he was one of the, the people that I worked with um, as a team that put together an open letter um, outlining the links between climate change and bushfires um, in Australia. Um, that's work that we've continued to develop into a review paper that's about to be submitted. Um, so it's, it's very nice to be able to hear some more about Jason's work today. Um, as a fun little fact, we also discovered a couple of months ago that years and years and years ago, we attended the same little high school on the outskirts of Newcastle. So that was a, a, a strange little collision of worlds. Um, but anyway, um, uh, I will stop talking now and pass over to Jason so we can hear about um, his work on extreme wildfire development. Thanks very much, Jason. Great, thank you, Narely. And uh, yes, I'd also just like to uh, pay my respects to the traditional owners of the country I'm on, Ngunnawal country, and particularly to the elders who have looked after the country and continue to look after it. So my plan for today was to really try and give you a bit of a broad overview of some of the work that we've been doing as, um, within the, the UNSW Bushfire Research Group, um, particularly work we've been looking at around extreme fire development, although I probably want to try and focus a little bit more on the fire behavioural aspect of that, other than the, uh, the atmospheric component, but I'll get to that. I should point out too that um, even though my name sort of appears there, this is by no means a, a solo effort. It's, it's really work that's been done uh, by the group over quite a quite well, probably 10, 10 or so years, if I, if I think about it. All right, so I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so extreme wildfires, I should um, define that to begin with. If I can get this thing to work. So just to try and explain to you what an extreme wildfire is, I think the best way to do that is really to start off by telling you what an extreme wildfire is not. And so if I show you a picture like this, then clearly that's not an extreme wildfire. Um, this is Alan MacArthur and his uh, research team up on Black Mountain, which looms over the Research School of Earth Sciences there at ANU, um, back in the 60s, conducting fire behavioural experiments. Um, I threw this one in just to sort of give you an example of the opposite end of the spectrum from what I'm going to be talking about, but also because of its historical significance. These are the sorts of experimental fires that went into informing these familiar risk management tools. I'm guessing everyone in Australia has seen these on the side of the road. Um, so even though there were some wildfires incorporated into, de into the development of this tool, the majority of the uh, experimental data that underpins it is coming from fires like this one here. So that's not an extreme bushfire. Um, this isn't an extreme bushfire either, even though it's something that you probably don't want to be caught out in the open. Uh, having bearing down on you. Um, so that's not an extreme bushfire. Um, something like that, well, it might be. It's a bit hard to tell, and that's kind of the point I'm trying to make here, is that the perspective 
of the photographer here is too narrow, okay? They're too close to the fire to really be able to appreciate whether we're looking at an extreme bushfire or not, okay? Because when I talk about an extreme bushfire or an extreme wildfire, I'll use those terms interchangeably, slowly becoming more international in my, my terminology, but I'll use them interchangeably. When we're talking about an extreme wildfire, what we're really talking about is things which look like this, okay? So you can see that perspective is now a lot more broader. The photographer's several tens of kilometers away from the fire. And you can see that, well, we're not even really seeing flames or anything like that. We're really looking at these things and appreciating them, not just as a fire burning on the surface, but something which is now um, taken on the characteristics of, a, of an atmospheric event. Okay, so a little bit more terminology. Um, which I think is important to really try and define the problem that we're talking about. Got these two photos here. And again, you can see there's a difference in the perspective of the photographer. Uh, the one on the left here, uh, the photographer is only a few hundred meters away. This is a fairly famous fire uh, that occurred in Colorado in 1994. South Canyon fire, famous because it uh, claimed the lives of 14 uh, wildland firefighters. Fairly tragic event. Um, but again, you can see it's a nasty fire. You've got fairly, um, well, you can see the dark smoke here is signifying fairly uh, significant fire behavior happening. But comparing this fire to the one on the right, again, which is one from the previous side, slide, this is the uh, force of Dunalley fire from Tasmania, it took out the township of Dunalley in 2013. Again, the photographer is a, a lot further back. And if you look at the areas of these fires, Okay, we're talking about well, 14 firefighters killed, area of 900 hectares. The one on the right, we're talking about a whole township destroyed and an area of 20,000 hectares. So there's this clear difference in scale. If you go back and look at the, uh, some of the wildfire glossaries that have existed in the literature for quite a while, then when you look at something like the South Canyon fire, then it sort of fits with what we would call a blow up fire. Okay, so a blow up fire, if you go back and look at the, the National Wildfire Coordinating Group uh, Glossary, 2018 edition, that a blow up is characterized as a sudden increase in fire line intensity and rate of spread, often accompanied by violent convection, and it also talks about firestorm characteristics. What's a firestorm? Well, if you look again at the, uh, at the glossary, a firestorm is probably something more like what we're seeing in the Denali fire there. And it's talking about the actual, you know, the convection more than the fire, but it's violent convection caused by a large continuous area of intense fire and often characterized by destructively violent surface indrafts. So here you can start to see, this is starting to bring in these concepts of the fire creating its own weather. Okay, so the one on the left was a, a block, it's more sort of localized, uh, uh, whereas the one on the right becomes this, this broader scale event. So, if I wanted to try and distinguish the two a little bit um, more, I would say when I'm talking about an extreme wildfire, it's going to comprise one or more blow up fire events. Whereas if we're dealing with a blow up fire event on its own, there's no guarantee that that will develop into an extreme wildfire. So there's this difference in, uh, in scale. So basically the, the issue we had, and I should say, the, even though I picked these out from the 2018 edition of the, the uh, Wildland Fire Glossary, if you go back and look at the previous editions, those uh, remain pretty much unchanged going back to the 50s. Okay, so these are sort of definitions we've had for a long time. Um, I'm not, well, I wasn't convinced that these were sort of the best definitions to um, carry the science forward. So what we did in 2016 was we had a go at trying to better define a particular phenomenon that we're looking at and calling it an extreme wildfire. So the definition we came up with was that an extreme wildfire is a fire that exhibits deep or widespread flaming. So this is the, the continuous area of um, you know, intense flame that was talked about in the firestorm definition in the previous slide. But we added the uh, the uh, caveat that this needed to happen in an atmospheric, uh, atmospheric environment conducive to the development of violent pyroconvection. Okay, and violent pyroconvection often manifesting as towering pyrocumulus or pyrocumulonimbus storms. Okay, so pyrocumulonimbus, uh, I guess, what would 
probably more properly characterised as fire storms. These are actually thunderstorms in their own right. I think if I had a go at writing, writing this definition again now, I would actually delete the word often there. Okay? Extreme wildfires are always going to be either towering pyrocumulus, okay? uh, cumulus congestus flammogenitus, if you really want to get technical, or pyrocumulant in the storms. The two bits I've got in blue there, I guess, are just to highlight the essential components of the phenomenon. Okay? It involves deeper widespread flaming and you must have a, a suitable atmospheric environment to, for that deep um, uh, pyroconvection um, for the column to develop into a deep, deep plume. The real key concept that we're um, sort of addressing here is that these sorts of events, these sorts of events involve a coupling of the fire with the atmosphere. Okay, that coupling extends well above the mix layer and the coupling is to an extent where it actually um, is able to modify or maintain the fire's propagation. Okay, and it does, does this through things like um, mass spotting, uh, really strong indrafts that we'll talk about in the, uh, the, the definition of the firestorm in the, uh, the NWCG glossary, and also things like pyrogenic lightning, um, lightning coming from the, the fire's plume when it develops into a pyro CB thunderstorm. Just Quickly before I move on, just to, to be clear, there's also this term of megafire, which is used a lot in the media um, these days. Just want to make the distinction that when I think of an extreme wildfire and a megafire, they're two different things. So I've just got a few dot points here, which were taken from a concept paper published in 20, uh, 2005. Um, so they're talking about megafires as being these headline wildfires. So they're not just these physical events, they become um, socio-political events. Um, they often involve rapid escalation and overcome efforts to control. I think given what we've sort of learned in the intervening 15 years or so, I wouldn't say that's a particularly uh, defining feature, not a you know, exclusive feature to megafires. It's probably getting more into the extreme wildfire territory. Megafires are generally very large and complex um, things to deal with. Um, but the real thing about a megafire is that they're frequently long lived. Okay? They require a large commitment of suppression resources and tie those resources up for over an extended period of time. My colleague, Rick McRae from the ACT Emergency Services Agency actually um, chimed in on a discussion that was going on last year uh, in Wildfire Magazine, which is the uh, Professional Society's uh, publication. Um, he basically took the view uh, megafires are really more of an issue that arise from long term changes to vegetation uh, state. Um, they're really a management, a consequence of management choices and suppression doctrine. Whereas on the other hand, extreme wildfires are these carefully defined things, which I defined on the previous slide, um, where we're talking about fires which specifically couple with the atmosphere and exhibit dynamic. Um, characteristics. Rick says that megafires and extreme fires aren't really related beyond the fact that some megafires happen to be extreme wildfires. I would probably go a little bit further than that and say that really when you're talking about a megafire, you're talking about a large, long sort of campaign, you know, weekly or monthly time scale fire, which will exhibit extreme wildfire characteristics on an episodic basis. Okay, so an extreme wildfire, we're really talking about something which lasts you know, perhaps a few hours, whereas a megafire can take weeks or months to, to run its course. Of note though is that a lot of the significant impacts that a megafire might exact will occur during episodes of extreme wildfire development. Okay, so hopefully that's given everyone an idea of what I'm talking about when I say an extreme wildfire. We're talking about a coupled wildfire, a coupled fire atmosphere event. Um, and where that, that coupling is you know, enough to really affect the uh, propagation of the fire. All right, so now that we've sort of defined what they are, we can really start to think about what causes these things to develop. Okay, so when we think about the drivers of what uh, causes an extreme wildfire to development, if you go back and look in the literature, then you know, from the historical perspective, Understanding extreme wildfire development has really been couched in terms of the atmospheric uh, 
um, conditions. Okay, and there's kind of two important aspects. The first one is what's going on at the surface. So hot, dry, and windy surface meteorological conditions are, have always been recognized as a key factor. Um, but then there's also these um, higher level conditions getting into the lower and mid-level of the troposphere. The surface weather conditions have been uh, described in terms of, well, in Australia, we have the Forest Fire Danger Index. Um, in places like Canada and, and most of Europe and New Zealand, they have the Fire Weather Index. And in the States now, they seem to be switching over to this new index, the HDW Index, which stands for Hot, Dry and Windy. Uh, literally, Hot, Dry and Windy. And that, I should say, also involves um, not quite the surface, but some layers um, a kilometre or so above, above incorporating things like vapor pressure deficit. When you get into the lower or mid-level tropospheric conditions, then they've been characterised through things like the Haynes Index, which was initially developed in, in the States. Um, it's been adapted um, to be more suitable to Australian conditions um, via the Continuous Haynes Index or the Sea Haynes Index. Also concepts like CAPE, Convective Available Potential Energy, which is a, it's a, a thunderstorm prediction tool, and it's been adapted for a, a use in predicting fire um, thunderstorms as well through fire cake, which basically just incorporates heat and moisture from the fire into the calculation. And then more recently, we have things like the, the Pyro CB fire power threshold, which has been developed out of the, uh, the Bureau of Net. Um, that Pyro CB fire power threshold basically looks at the Briggs plume equation and does a sort of a reverse engineering exercise to work out how much power your fire needs to have to, to get to the level of free convection in the atmosphere. I'm not gonna, not gonna go into that, but. Um, the interesting thing though, is when you look at this, this historical way these things have been understood, and it's all in terms of the atmospheric drivers, well, from the definition that I gave, it was really focusing on the fact that if these extreme wildfires manifest as coupled fire atmosphere events, so even though the atmosphere is important, the fact that you're looking at a fire atmosphere uh, event, which is a, a coupled event, that would really say, well, what role does the fire play? And there's been a lot less attention played to the dynamics of the fire. And I guess that's something we've been, we've been addressing in the group. Um, before I get to that, though, I just wanted to have a look at some of these traditional tools, the way extreme wildfires have been understood. I'll look at the Fire Danger Index and C. Haynes in particular and just point out some of the limitations. So as I said, in Australia, we've got the uh, MacArthur Forest Fire Danger Index. We also have the Grass Fire Danger Index, but it's not that applicable to extreme wildfires. And we have the Continuous Haynes Index to characterize mid-level, lower and mid-level tropospheric conditions. So the MacArthur Index, FFDI, is just uh, given by this equation here. It involves uh, this D here, which is a drought factor, which is really a measure of um, available fuel, okay, fuel that's dry enough to burn, uh, temperature and relative humidity, T and the RH here. These are really um, telling you what your fuel moisture contents are like. And then the U here is a uh, wind speed of 10 meters. Okay, so it's literally, you know, this is the hot, the dry and the windy, and then a bit of a, um, a drought effect as well. Uh, continuous Haynes Index is made up of two components, CA and CB, you add those together. The CA and CB individually are just numbers between one and six. Uh, the CA is the stability component. So you can see that's just looking at the, uh, the temperature lapse between the 850 and 700 hectopascal levels. And the CB is the moisture component, which looks at the dew point depression at the uh, 850 hectopascal level. Okay, so it's saying if you've got an unstable atmosphere and you've got dry, dry air at that sort of mid-level, then that's um, bad for fires. Um, what we did with some colleagues from the Kensington campus and, and elsewhere um, last year, yeah, last year or the year before, oh yeah, 2019, um, we had a look at a whole bunch of um, fires. Some of these fires produced pyro CBs, some of them didn't. And basically what I've got here is just two different distributions for where these um, different fires sort of fell into. Okay, so the top one here, we're looking at the distribution of fire danger rating categories for fires which produced pyro CVs. Okay, so these are extreme wildfires. 
The one on the bottom is the same thing, but for the fires which didn't produce fire CVs. Okay, so like standard non-extreme wildfires. An interesting thing you see is that fire danger or surface fire weather doesn't do that good a job of discriminating one from the other. Okay, you can see that actually most of the pyro CBs were just in this very high category. So even though I've referred to these as extreme wildfires, you don't necessarily have to have extreme fire danger conditions for them to be produced. Okay, so not a lot of difference between these two distributions. And so this surface fire weather metrics aren't giving us very good discrimination between when a fire is going to be a pyro CB or not. We can go and then look at the uh, continuous Haynes index. When we look at this, we go, aha, okay, so now we've got all our pyro CBs are always forming when our C Haynes is seven or above. Okay, so perhaps that's a, a good diagnostic to look for. If our C Haynes is above seven, then we're in um, you know, suitable conditions for pyro CBs. Um, unfortunately, though, when you look at the non pyro CBs or the standard wildfires, then you can see that the discrimination there is not great. And in fact, you've got about 50% of your non pyro CVs forming when the C. Haynes is above seven. Okay, so again, C. Haynes by itself is not a great discriminator of whether we're gonna get a pyro CV or not. More to that, um, in Australia, um, I guess one of the, the real limitations of the Haynes index is that on a hot summer's day, where you're likely to get fires, the C. Haynes index is almost always above seven anyway, so it's, it doesn't do a great job of discriminating further conditions suitable for pyro CB development. Well, what about if we look at them both together? Okay, so not just FFDI and C. Haynes in isolation, what if we combine them? So that's what we have going on in this complicated plot. I'll take a little bit of time just to, to run you through what's going on here, because there's, there's a fair bit. So we've got C. Haynes plotted on the vertical axis, we've got FFDI on the horizontal axis. The colour theme there, the blue to the red, is basically just looking at all days and the, in, during the study period and um, giving you a, a frequency of you know, how, how likely uh, different conditions are to form. Okay, so you can see here the red is high likelihood of low FFDI and a C. Haynes of around two. Whereas you know, these events out here where you've got high C Haynes and a very high FFDI are very rare, and most of the events sort of fall along this, this line which we're going through here. Okay, so that's the underlying background is just a, a probability. All the points we've got going on here, the red, um, the dots or the, the points with red infill are our standard wildfires. So that's just telling you where they've occurred on this C Haynes FFDI parameter space and the ones with white filling are the pyro CBs. So again, you can sort of see here that you've got this area where you've got lots of pyro CBs, but you've got also lots of standard wildfires going on. Okay, so not very good discrimination even when we're looking at both indices together. The other thing going on in this plot is that the points have different um, shapes and different colored outlines. The different shapes are referring to um, the terrain that the fires have burnt in, and the colour of the outline is telling you about the fuels that the uh, fires burnt in. And this is where you start to see a bit further, a bit more discrimination between the pyro CBs and the standard wildfires. If you have a look in this region here, hopefully you can see this um, cursor in this area where you've got a lot of overlap. If you look at the pyro CBs, they're all crosses and triangles, okay, which are referring to our more rugged landscapes. Whereas the standard wildfires are all squares, which are our fires happening in flat um, plains and flatter landscapes. Moreover, if we look at the pyro CBs, they've all got green outlines. So these are all happening in forests. Whereas if you look at the, uh, the red ones, then a lot of those are, are black. Okay, so these are happening in sort of grasslands and, and, and lighter fuels. Okay, so what this really points us to is something we probably should have known all along, is that when it comes to extreme wildfires, it's not just about the atmosphere. Uh, fuel and terrain also play an important part. Okay, and when we think about fuel and terrain, the, point, the part that they play, that brings us back to uh, you know, the fact that we have to then consider about what the fire is doing in terms of its behaviour. Okay, here I've just got the little uh, wildfire um, fire behaviour triangle. 
which says fire behavior is not just about the weather, it also involves topography and fuel, which is exactly what this plot's telling us. Okay, so this suggests to us that um, the local dynamics of the fire is gonna play a very important role in driving uh, extreme wildfire development. In fact, we can see that in this, uh, this nice photograph here. This is the Rim Fire, which was a mega fire, burnt in Yosemite National Park back in 2013. Um, but the interesting thing about this fire is you can see there's a lot of landscape on fire there. Uh, it's all burning under you know, the, the same sort of broad scale uh, conditions. But you can see that there are these localized centers of uh, violent pyro convection. So you can see this little bit of the plume popping up over here. We have this bit here and this bit here. Hopefully you can see my pointer. The interesting thing about these two here in particular is that not only are they localized, but they seem to be localized in a way which is associated with lateral propagation of the fire. Now, what I mean by that is if you look at the wind, okay, the wind's sort of pushing straight up the screen like that, and that's the way you would normally expect the fire to run. But you've got these instances where the fire is actually spread almost perpendicular to the wind. So this really tells us that it's, it's not a simple problem. Okay? You can't just look at this in terms of the broad atmospheric conditions. The problem's multi-scale. You have these broad atmospheric conditions sort of producing different effects in different parts of the landscape. It involves complex coupling between the fire, the atmosphere, and other features, such as the fuel and the terrain, just as we've said. All right, so that's going to bring us back. I'll just flash up the, um, the definition I had uh, earlier on before. So when you're talking about an extreme wildfire is a fire that exhibits deep or widespread flaming. So this is kind of the fire behavioral aspect in an atmospheric environment conducive to the development of pyro convection. Okay, so we have this fire behavioral aspect and we have the atmospheric aspect. Given that definition, uh, and sort of one of the reasons that we, we framed it that way was because if we understand Extreme, wife, extreme wildfire in those terms, then it immediately prompts us to asking the following questions if we want to try and understand how extreme wildfires develop. So if extreme wildfires are caused by deep or widespread flaming, then what causes deep or widespread flaming? If we're talking about having an atmospheric, condu atmospheric environment conducive to the development of violent pyro convection, what does that actually mean? How do we know when the atmosphere is conducive to development of pyro convection? And moreover, how do these two different aspects of the problem go together? Okay, so what I'm getting at there is, you know, given some sort of ambient uh, atmospheric state, okay, which might be marginally conducive to thunderstorm development, how much deep flaming do you need to tip the balance to uh, producing these extreme wildfires? All right, so this is um, sort of currently in the too hard basket, or that's something we're working on. Um, we're getting better at the second one, but the one I, want to, one I want to spend the most time on is this first one about what causes deep or widespread flaming. Before I get to that though, I've just got this little cartoon uh, just to illustrate what I'm talking about. What is deep flaming? Well, again, the best way to understand it is to cont contrast it with something which is not deep flaming. And so in this cartoon here, I've got some green area here, which is our unburnt fuel. I have some black stuff here, which is our burnt fuel. And I've got this sort of front of flame, which is a narrowly, uh, you know, relatively narrow uh, uh, region of active flame, okay? And this is what most fires look like. Um, this is what probably uh, pops into the head of most members of the public when they think of a fire. That's this front, which you can sort of, you know, it's fairly well defined and you, know, you can run away from it if it gets too close. Um, when we're talking about deep flaming though, the picture looks more like this one. Okay, so you can see now we, we don't really have a well-defined front. Okay, there's a lot of spot fires going on. We have these areas um, involved in active flaming rather than just a thin region at the front of the fire. And so these are quite, to be considered quite different to an ordinary fire front. Okay, so when I'm talking about deep flaming, this is the, the sort of picture to have in mind. I'll show you some real examples uh, later on. So that's what deep flaming is. What causes deep flaming? Well, we kind of have this rogues gallery, which is slowly developing of triggers, 
fire behavioural triggers uh, for deep flaming. Um, things like strong winds. Okay, if you've got a strong enough wind, then uh, the head of the flaming zone can advance faster than the back of the flaming zone takes to, to burn out. Okay, and you can get a, a broadening of the, of the fire, of the burning zone through that. Uh, a wind change can cause the long flank of a fire to become a head fire, rapidly moving head fire. Uh, something I'll talk about um, in a bit more detail uh, in the following slides, but something called vorticity driven lateral spread, which we've probably known about for about 10 years now. Um, mass spotting, fire coalescence, fire eruption, which is another fairly recent uh, thing we've come to appreciate. And this is my most recent one that I've added to the list, overzealous use of incendiaries. So here I'm talking about um, people perhaps adding too much fire into the landscape than, than is required. The last four of those I want to single out because they involve what we call dynamic fire propagation. Now, I'll just explain what I mean by that. Um, most of the fire um, behavioural models that we have, um, that we use operationally, um, are kind of based on an implicit, an implicit assumption that if you have a particular set of environmental um, conditions, wind, temperature, relative humidity, all that sort of thing, fuel load, etc. If you have a particular set of environmental conditions, then you can use those to uniquely define a rate of spread. Okay, so one given set of conditions defines a, a unique rate of spread. Okay, now, again, this, is, this assumption, which we refer to as the quasi-steady assumption, assumes that our fire has basically evolved to a steady state. Okay, once it's evolved to that steady state, then you can explain or you can describe uh, the fire behavioral characteristics just in terms of those environmental variables. Okay, and nothing changes too much. For run-of-the-mill conditions, that's probably a pretty good uh, assumption to make. But when we're talking about you know, more extreme fire weather conditions and fires escalating to extreme wildfires, it's not a very good assumption to make, okay? Because when the things ramp up like that, what you start to get is feedbacks between the fire and the environment, including fire atmosphere coupling, okay? Which basically says we're no longer dealing with steady state fire behavior. Okay, our fire is now acting in a non-steady or a dynamic uh, fashion. The other nasty thing about these things is that they're subject to threshold behavior, okay? These are standard things that occur in dynamical systems. You can cross a threshold and suddenly you're in a, a completely different um, state of behavior. The problem uh, with this from the operational perspective is that we don't really have very good um, operational capacity to be able to account for dynamic fire behaviors. Okay, we've got the steady state stuff down pretty well, but when steady state goes out the window, then we're kind of at a loss for what to do. And you know, if you look at, talk to people in the fire management game from the last season, there were multiple times where the fire behavior exceed, exceeded what the models were, were, were you know, predicting. And that's probably for these sorts of reasons. All right, so I just want to give you a couple of examples. I'm going to talk about um, vorticity-driven lateral spread and some of these others, and just highlight how some of the dynamic natures and how they, um, uh, yeah, how these threshold um, conditions come in and so on. All right, so here's a picture of a real fire. This is the um, Yankees Gap fire, which burnt down on the south coast of New South Wales at Ben Boca back in, I think, September 2018, and actually burnt again last season. What we're looking at here is we've got a uh, sort of a, think of it as a thermal line scan. It's basically the orange bits are telling you where the fire is. The wind on the day was coming out of the northwest, signified by this arrow. And what I want to focus on is this little fire here. Okay, so straight away, the interesting thing is that the fire has been lit here and has straight away started spreading back up this hill, almost in complete opposition to the wind. So that's already sort of breaking the rules a little bit. It's indicative of a, a wind terrain interaction going on. There's some sort of lee eddies in that region, causing the fire to spread back up the hill. That's at 20 past one in the afternoon. Here's what the fire looked like about an hour later. And just to sort of orient us, 
this little fire here is this bit here. Okay, so you can see the two little white ellipses there showing you the same spot in the landscape. And so again, you can see that despite the fact that the wind was out of the northwest, the fire actually developed um, along these ridge lines. Okay, it's showing you the connection to the topography, but it developed to the southwest and then spilled out downwind. Okay, so that's a little bit unusual. Um, you've got this sort of big region here of uniform spectral signature where basically the sensors have saturated and that basically just means whatever was going on the ground there was quite hot. Okay, so lots of active flaming going on over a fairly large region. If you want to talk about growth of area over that hour, well, the fire grew by about 500 hectares within that hour. Okay, which is a fairly substantial rate of growth. Okay, so here we can see a, a small fire, which within the hour has transitioned to a deep flaming event. The lateral spread um, that's happened here is an example of vorticity driven lateral spread. So that's something that we started looking into about 10 years ago. Um, we've studied it to death, although we're still learning new things about it. What I've got in this slide is two uh, realizations of vorticity driven lateral spread. One's in the, in the laboratory in a wind tunnel. So this is a, a little uh, triangular hill we've made. Um, we've stuck it in the wind tunnel. The wind is coming directly out towards you and the slope is going back into the screen. Okay, so this is a, a leeward slope that you're looking at here. We've lit a fire down the bottom in the middle and what's happened is the fire has spread up. Once it's got to the ridge line, it's um, spread laterally, just like you see in this computer simulation. Interesting thing here is that this is sort of a meter scale laboratory experiment, and this is a kilometer scale uh, coupled fire atmosphere simulation, producing very similar patterns of behavior. Um, what you're not seeing in the experiments is that when this thing starts to go across the ridge, it starts to spot. Okay, and that's what gives you that downwind uh, deep flaming or the downwind infill of the fire. Okay, we don't account for the spotting in the experiments or the, or the numerical simulations here. So here's a real fire. This is the uh, Wombalong fire back in 2013, which burnt um, Warren Bungles National Park and took out the Siding Springs um, Observatory. Not completely, but did a fair bit of damage. What I've got here on the, on the left is I've got two stages of the fire. Okay, so on the left, I've got earlier in the day where the winds were from the north northwest, and then later in the day where the winds, winds had swung around to the west. And the thing I want you to look at is just this little bit of the fire that's going on here. Okay, this is an easterly facing slope. Hopefully you can see my cursor there. So when the winds were from the west, uh, from the north, north or west, you can see the wispy smoke coming off that east facing slope, indicative of fairly mild smoldering type fire behavior. Okay, nothing too spectacular going on. However, as the winds switched around to the west, that easterly slope became a, a lee slope, put it into the, uh, the threshold where vorticity lateral spread is likely to occur, and you can see the escalation in fire behavior associated with that. Okay, and this fire went on to produce a fairly significant pyrocumulonimbus. nimbus. Okay, so you have these sort of threshold um, effects coming in, which means you can switch from you know, relatively benign fire behavior to relatively serious fire behavior in fairly short short time frames. I'll just quickly show you this, um, these two little uh, plots here. This is looking at a, the fire or eruptive fire process, fire eruption. What we've got here are two CFD simulations of a fire, well it's not a fire, it's just a, uh, these little black squares here are just hot boxes if you like, creating a hot plume. So it's looking at how the plume uh, interacts with what we have here is an inclined, an inclined trench, okay, so something similar to a, a canyon in, in, the, in the bush. The red is hot, blue is cold, so you can see in this uh, one here on the left, you've got the plume sort of rising up to the top of the domain, whereas on the one on the right, the hot plume is staying attached to the surface and traveling up. So what is the difference between these two simulations? Okay, why is this one rising up? Why is this one attached? Well, the only difference between these two simulations is the actual inclination of the trench. And 
the one on the left is inclined at 24 degrees, the one on the right is at 26 degrees. Okay, so just with that two degrees change in inclination, you've gone from a fire which would, you know, a plume which would sort of move up into the air and most of the fire spread would be dominated by radiative heat transfer. Increase the uh, angle by two degrees and now you've got a fire which is moving up the slope very quickly, dominated by convective heat transfer. Okay, so this is going to produce a much deeper flaming region, update, much deeper flaming region uh, over a shorter amount of time. Okay, so again, a trigger for deep flame. And again, just highlighting that very abrupt threshold that exists for these sorts of fire behaviours. Um, other thing that we've been doing uh, is trying to better account for interaction between different parts of the fire. So this is work I've been doing with uh, James Hilton uh, from Data61 CSIRO. It's part of our work funded by the Bushfire Natural Hazards CRC. What we're doing in this work is we're just saying, okay, we want to try and have a fire spread model which incorporates some of these dynamic interactions, but we want to have one which runs faster than real time which is what we need to, to be able to use these things in an operational sense. Okay, I should have mentioned that the, the coupled fire atmosphere models that we've been playing around with, even though they give us physical insights into the process, they're not feasible for operational use because you know, it takes two days to run two hours of a fire. Okay, so we want models which can run faster in real time. So what we're doing in this um, exercise here is we're basically saying, well, let's just look at a little bit of the fire, this little square here. We've got a bit of fire. It's going up. And what we can think of is, you know, as the as the air is forced up through um, through uh, pyroconvection, buoyant movement of air, the fire that uh, the air that goes up has to re be replaced by air basically coming in from the sides. So the, the U and the V here. Okay, so that gives us a way of thinking about how we can incorporate um, the fire's effect on the atmosphere. What we then do is we sort of put it through a whole bunch of mathematics. Um, Basically, what we say is that this little bit of fire creates this pyrogenic wind. Okay, U sub P is the pyrogenic wind. And what we essentially do here is a very simple idea, which we borrowed from the theory of electrostatics, is to just say, we just think of that, um, that little bit of fire where the plume moves up as a sink for the horizontal flow. Okay, once we do that, then we can characterize the process in terms of a Poisson equation and um, you know, use potential theory to basically Give us, the, uh, give us the answer. Of course, the strength of that sink is going to depend on the intensity of the fire. Okay, so that gives us a coupling between the intensity of the fire and the, uh, the effect it produces on the wind. We can then feed that wind back into um, driving the fire, which is the ambient wind plus the pyrogenic wind you see in this uh, term here. And so this gives us a way of, a very simple way of coupling the fire with the atmosphere. Okay, so we have now have a very simple coupled fire atmosphere model, but it runs in seconds rather than hours using the level set method. What the model allows us then to do, as we can see in this example, is it allows us to start to um, run simulations where the fires are interacting. So here we have two point ignitions um, being driven by a wind going straight up the page, but you can see as the fires evolve, they feel each other. Okay, they're aware of each other's presence. Okay, they start to move in and merge. Okay, so this is starting to get fires interacting with each other. Even uh, more impressively, I thought, was that we can now actually account for very simple fire behaviours, which the types of models that we've had up until now can't actually account for. So it's a well-known thing that if you light a line of fire perpendicular to a wind, then that straight line fire pretty much immediately evolves into this curved front. So you can see that with the actual fire in these examples here. This is a laboratory test in the uh, pyrotron that Andrew Sullivan um, did, um, part of the, the CSIRO bushfire group we're working with. Um, if you were to use a traditional model which didn't incorporate these um, fire line interactions, what you would get from your model is just a, a, a line of fire which remains straight in perpetuity. Okay, it's only when you incorporate these um, sort of pyroconvective interactions that you start to get the fire, um, or start to get the model looking the right shape. Okay, so once we've developed that model, we, we can then go on and look at more interesting things. Okay, so here we have two scenarios. 
where we've looked at a whole bunch of spot fires. So think of this as a sort of a mass spotting event where you've got a lot of spot fires um, forming ahead of a fire. Um, the top column here, I've got the model where we've got the fire line interaction turned on. And on the bottom uh, row here, we've got the uh, model with the fire line interaction turned off. So you can see when the model, uh, when the fire line interaction is turned off, we just basically get fires which evolve independently, just as little circles, they eventually bump into each other. But if you compare that to what happens when we turn the fire line interactions on, the fires come together much more quickly. And the red colouring here is saying that they do it with a higher intensity, okay? Faster rate of spread, and so higher intensity. What you can then do is you can then start to look at, well, okay, what happens if I look at this whole fire complex in terms of the amount of, uh, the amount, in terms of the amount of power that these fires are putting out? Okay, so that's what these graphs on the left are telling us about. The ends here are just the number of spot fires we're dealing with. So 5, 25, 50, and 100. Um, the red shading is what happens when you've got the interaction turned on. The blue one is when you've got the interaction turned off. So you can see if you've only got five spot fires, there's not much of a difference. 25 spot fires, then you're starting to see the interaction between the different spot fires creating a higher peak power. Okay, when you get up to 100 spot fires, that extra influence of the fire line or the different spot fires interacting becomes quite significant. So no difference for five, about a 10% higher peak power for 25, 40% for 50 fires and up to 75% for 100 fires. So the message that sort of is being indicated here is that if you've got a mass spotting event with you know, hundreds or thousands of spots occurring ahead of, a, ahead of a fire, then the potential for these fire line interactions to produce higher uh, peak fire powers is pretty significant. Okay, that then has consequences for how high your plume is going to grow and, and things like that. All right, so I'll just quickly take you through a little case in point. So this is a fire which happened back in the Blue Mountains in the Gross Valley, for people who are familiar with the area, uh, 22nd of November, 2006. Okay, so a fair while ago. Um, the fire actually started about, I think, one or two weeks before this scan is showing. But what you can see in this scan at, the, at, at um, this particular time is you've got these sort of fairly well-defined yellow fire fronts and the orange sort of smoldering and burnt bits behind it. Okay, so this is still, I would say, exhibiting ordinary frontal fire behavior at this point. Not long after this though, the conditions uh, increased. And so the next scan that was taken a couple of hours later, about three hours later, shows this. So now you've got these sort of areas of uniform spectral signature um, showing up again. If you compare those two scans, you can see the fires actually spread uh, towards the northeast, okay, across from the wind. And you've also had this mass spotting event um, come down the valley. The red shading here is basically um, from the radar, and that shows you where the high radar returns are. Okay, so this is your strong pyroconvection showing, showing up in the radar. And you can see that's associated with uh, the bits which are, are blowing up. A bit later on, um, this bit of the fire up here has settled down, it's now looking more like a frontal um, fire behaviour, but now we've got this bit down on the, uh, the southwest part of the fire. Again, if you compare the two scans, you can see it's moved to the southwest, so that's lateral spread again. And now all the strong radar returns are occurring downwind of that. Okay, so you've again got this link between the strong um, spatial, or spatial link between strong pyroconvection and where these dynamic fire behaviours are occurring. If we call this first one event one and the second one event two, then we can actually look at the temporal um, development of these events in terms of the echo top height of the plume derived from the radar. And you can see event one and event two are happening in close temporal proximity to where the plumes are hitting the tropopause. Okay, so these are pyro CB events occurring in now and as temporarily linked to these episodes of dynamic fire behavior. And there's a, a photo of event one if you're interested. Looking rather nasty. Interesting thing about that event um, is the place just here where we saw lateral spread in 2006, also it exhibited in the last um, spate of fires that we had. So this is the Gross Valley back on 21st December, 
part of the Gospers Mountain mega fire complex, but on this day, you've got a lateral spread occurring exactly the same spot. All right, so talked a bit about deep flaming, um, dynamic fire spread, um, and how that uh, connects with pyroconvection. I just want to talk about that a little bit more and say, well, why is deep flaming important for, for plume de development? And I think this is some work that's been done by my postdoc, Rachel Badlin, who's been looking at, uh, again, coupled fire atmosphere modeling, but what she's been doing is playing around with the, the, uh, the geometry, okay, the shape of the fire, if you like. So what she's got here, um, the little black and white um, schematic up in the top right corner of each plot, shows you the shape of the fire that she's dealing with. And I should say that these aren't really fires, these are just sort of hot shapes. Okay, so here, the one on the left, we've got a, a circle of one kilometer radius, uniform intensity, okay, just putting in as a, as a sensible heat flux. Um, the one in the middle is a rectangular fire, four to one ratio. And then the one on the right is a thin rectangle, 64 to one ratio. So if you think about these in terms of deep flaming, the one on the left is more like a deep flaming event, where the one on the right is more like a, an ordinary frontal uh, fire propagation scenario. What we've got here in the, in the uh, plots is just um, simulations of the plume, the convective plume that, um, that comes from each of these different shapes. Uh, I think the, the blue line there is the, uh, the tropopause. So you can see for our big circular deep flaming event, the plume goes straight up and goes through the tropopause up into the stratosphere. Uh, for the rectangular fire, it just punches through a little bit. But for our thin rectangular fire, we don't get anywhere near the tropopause. Okay, so this would be producing pyro CV, whereas this might be a you know pyro Q, relatively benign one even, but nowhere near a pyro CV. Important thing to note is that all of these regions are the same area and the intensity is the same. And so overall, they all have exactly the same amount of energy release. So even though they don't, even though they have the same energy release, depending on the geometry, some will go higher than others. Okay, and we can have a look at that in a bit more detail, just um, with a bunch of other shapes as well. Um, so here we've just got our, our circle corresponding to this point. The plume gets up to about 15 kilometers. A square also behaves pretty much the same way. Here's our four to one rectangle, still getting above the, uh, the tropopause. But then our thinner rectangles are all falling below the tropopause, even though they all have the same power. That's in no wind conditions. Um, if we start to add wind, there's a seven kilometer per hour wind, same sort of thing, 14 kilometers. Okay, and you sort of see wind is influencing things a bit, but still these fires, which are more like a deep flaming scenario, are the ones which are getting up and producing the pyro CV type of um, plume developments. Um, once we get up to a 36 kilometer per hour wind, you can start to see it flatten out for these um, more rectangular features. This is where the fire is actually transitioned to what we call a wind dominated fire. Okay, these ones here are still in the point where the plume is having a significant effect. So these are probably perhaps not pyro CBs, but certainly towering pyro Qs up at sort of 10 or 11 kilometers high. All right, so where this is kind of taking us is it's really giving us a way of thinking about how we can predict extreme wildfires. So this is some work I've been doing in uh, collaboration with, with Rick, Rick McRae, a um, long time collaborator, collaborator of mine. And so this is the framework that he's come up with. It's called the Blow Up Fire Outlook Model, the BUFO model. Rick's a uh, former, um, has sort of biological background, so he's thought it was funny to link it to, to Bufo Mar Marinus, which is the cane toad. Um, but anyway, the, the sort of the framework that we're dealing with is we sort of go through this flow chart on, on a particular day for a particular fire. Is the fire uncontrolled and is it a day of elevated fire danger? Well, if it's not, then there's probably not going to be anything to worry about. If it is, then we move on to the next question, which says, is there a mechanism for deep flaming present? Okay, so do we have things like strong winds, wind change? Is the fire burning in rugged terrain where you're likely to get fire eruption or autistic driven lateral spread? Is the, low, is the moisture content low enough that it's going to be conducive to mass spotting? Okay, if it is, then we move on. 
then we look at the atmospheric uh, component of it. So at the moment, we're just using C. Haynes, but I think there's good um, potential there to use things like the, uh, the Bureau's fire power threshold as well. So if we have a mechanism for deep flaming, if the atmospheric conditions are right, then we can put out a warning that this fire is likely to turn into extreme wildfire. So that's kind of where this, this research is heading um, in terms of operational um, information. Just want to finish up quickly just by looking at, I guess, which is hopefully something still on everyone's minds and something still people are interested in was the last fire season we had. Um, these are a couple of maps that Rick um, develops. The one on the left here is looking at the role of rugged terrain and the one on the right is looking at the role of fuel. Okay, the black and the red polygons are basically where we got the blow up fire events which turned into extreme wildfires. So first of all, you can see there's quite a lot of them, um, unprecedented number, in fact, quite a long way. But if you have a look at this, you can see that there's a pretty good correlation between where these are happening and the rugged bits of terrain. And over here, again, a pretty good correlation between where these events are happening and where you've got forest. Um, I said that the number of extreme wildfires were unprecedented. If you just want to hone in and look at the, uh, the number of pyro CBs, then you can see in the last couple of years, the last fire season, we've added a pretty decent chunk to the overall catalog of, of pyro CBs. This is a, a cumulative total uh, going back to the start of the satellite record. So yeah, pretty spectacular season in, in those terms. Um, for mine, um, even though there's been a lot of um, discussion about the role of um, hazard reduction and fuel loads played that, that played in the fire, um, for me it was really um, the best way to think about this fire is in terms of, of moisture and fuel availability. Okay, so the fires occurred at the end of an extended widespread drought. Okay, you can take any definition of drought that you like there, uh, which resulted in uniformly high fuel availability. Okay, over large regions of the southeast. Okay, fuel availability refers to the amount of fuel, which or the proportion of fuel which is dry enough to burn. On top of that uniformly high fuel availability, we had critically low fuel moisture content um, occur episodically, um, varying over daily or even uh, hourly timescales, which played a crucial role in driving the, uh, the blow up events and the ones that turned into extreme wildfires in particular. I'll show a plot where I'm going to talk about fuel moisture. And the way I talk about fuel moisture is through an index we came up with a few years ago called the, the Fuel Moisture Index. And it's just a simple index which reflects the fact that if it's hot and the relative humidity is low, then your fuel moisture is likely to be low. I'll single out a critical uh, fuel moisture index value of five and say that if our fuel moisture index is below five, then we're talking about critically low fuel moisture. So in this slide here, what I've done, these are the, the uh, pyro CB events for New South Wales. Uh, these are little dots, okay. The black solid ones are confirmed events. The open circles are unconfirmed events, but even though they're not confirmed as pyro CB, they're probably likely to be towering pyro Q, therefore qualify as extreme wildfires. Um, the blues and the red here is just telling us whether our fuel moisture content is above or below that threshold of five. Okay, and you can see that you know, you've got this pretty, well, pretty exact correlation between um, you know, when your pyro CBs or extreme wildfires are occurring and when you've got these negative um, anomalies in your fuel moisture content. Okay, so fuel moisture content is really important. I think that links back to the fact that when you've got really low fuel moisture contents, spotting becomes a very efficient process. They're the ones in New South Wales, just looking at, at Canberra as a representative station, which sort of sat in the middle of them all. We can do the same sort of thing for the Victorian events um, using OMEO again as a representative station. And again, you can see the pyro CBs are basically happening when you've got these negative anomalies creeping in. Um, this was a particular fire that happened during the season, um, the Green Valley fire. And this was the fire most people I think would have heard of, which um, resulted in the death of a firefighter when they're tanker was flipped, okay? That occurred at point two. Okay, the one, the other event people don't know about very much is that there was also another event here at point three where a New South Wales Rural Fire Service group uh, officer's vehicle was actually blown off the road and, and eventually burnt. He was lucky to escape with only um, a concussion. 
thing to point out in this, um, this figure though, is that we have the fire starting up here at the point of origin. The wind was from the northwest. You would normally expect the fire to basically make a thin uh, finger or a thin sort of um, shape here with the wind. But what happened was the fire pretty much immediately spread laterally. Okay, the gray shading that we can see in this map is regions of the landscape prone to vorticity driven lateral spread. So again, in this fire, as you can see these, these dynamic fire aspects um, coming into the play. All right, so that's all I really had. I mean, just to, to conclude, um, important to note that when it comes to looking at these sorts of fires, we need to think of them as kind of different entities to the normal run of the mill fires that we get. And in uh, making that acknowledgement, real, realizing that traditional prediction tools are likely to be limited in their ability to predict their behavior. We really need to think of these events, not just as a fire or not just as something being affected by the atmosphere, but as coupled fire atmosphere events. Okay, so we really need to acknowledge the respective roles that both the fire and the, and the atmosphere play separately and also in combination. Dynamic fire behavior is critical in driving deep flaming and deep flaming, it seems is a necessary and probably even a conditionally sufficient uh, thing to happen for an extreme wildfire to, to come about. And of course, I'm a researcher, so I'm always gonna say that we need to do more research, but seriously, further research is, is required for us to understand these uh, sorts of events, um, thinking about how these different atmospheric and fire behavioral aspects come together. So that's all I've got. Um, thanks to Louie and Merrily for the invitation and the uh, introduction. I think most of those other ones are just people who I've received funding from and um, key colleagues who've um, contributed to the work along the way. So thanks for your attention and hopefully it was interesting. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, people can clap virtually by uh, pressing the little clapping button, but uh, it was, it's always a little, uh, it's a little, little artificial. So uh, there's my clap on behalf of everyone. Thank you so much. Um, so in order to operate questions, I have released everybody from, I'm, I'm not able to unmute themselves. And if you would like to raise your hand, if you have a question, uh, preferably virtually, because we can't see everybody in the in, in video. But if you have a question, please virtually raise your hand, unless you're narrowly, because you won't have the ability to raise your hand, except in real life. Um, well, I'll, I'll raise it <laughs> and, and ask a question. Um, so, uh, so I was saying thank you. That was a, a really informative um, presentation. I got a lot out of that. Um, what I, I was wanting to ask you about was um, because you see this role of terrain um, in the development of these extreme fires, does that tell us um, things about sort of where we should be concentrating our efforts in terms of firefighting or are there particular areas that are just always going to be susceptible to these types of fires and we should be sort of like not developing in those areas? Um, does does the, the work lead in that sort of direction at all? Uh, absolutely, yeah. And I mean, that's, I mean, I, I, I mean, well, I, I think you, you stop these fires five years before they happen. I mean, that's, you know, on, on the particular day, once they're ramped up, you can't do anything about them. So yeah, I think that's one of the one of the things we've been particularly looking at is if, you know, if you can tie these sorts of dynamic processes to particular parts of the landscape, then that gives you a more targeted um, you know, picture of where you might want to prioritise things like hazard reduction burning and where you don't want to put um, people downwind of and things like that. Interesting, where um, I was involved um, with the uh, there's a a development going on in Canberra on the, uh, sort of the, the northwest outskirts called the Ginandary Project. Um, so I wrote a report on that which said, well, actually where you're putting 30,000 people is immediately downwind of a region prone to what you see driven lateral spread. And, you know, just sort of tried to raise the alarm there somewhat, but um, of course they're gonna put 30,000 people there anyway. So we'll see what happens in the next 50 years or so with that. Uh, any other questions?
That's a little surprising. So what I might do is, um, we've run on a little bit late, so that's partly the, the problem people have to leave. So what I might ask is uh, if, we, if we stop recording and there are any students who want a sort of more informal chat with Jason, or anybody else who wants a more informal chat with Jason that's not a recorded formal question and answer, then uh, now is the time to do that. Once again, thank you. And uh, those of us who do need to leave or those of us who uh, would like to leave and let the students um, have priority, um, now is the time to do that. So thank you very much again.